Okay. The Jets have fired Robert Sala after a 2-3 and three start. Ultimately, upset by the team's 2-3 and three start, Jets owner Woody Johnson has made a stunning and unprecedented move Tuesday morning by firing coach Robert Sala and naming defensive coordinator Jeff Ulbrich as the interim head coach. Johnson, with his first in-season coaching change in 25 years of ownership, said he consulted with general manager Joe Douglas. But he called it my decision in mine alone. I'm sure Steve Kaplowitz has heavy opinions on said matter. Let's move to the Patriots as they plan to start rookie quarterback Drake May this upcoming Sunday against the Texans. Rookie Drake May is taking over the New England Patriots starting position. A source told ESPN's Adam Schefter. May, the third overall pick in the 2024 draft, is replacing nine-year veteran Jacoby Brissett as the Patriots, who are 1-4, and four, prepare to host the the Houston, Texas. Let's move on to the WNBA and collegiate basketball. USC's Juju Watkins has reached a lucrative extension with Nike. USC sophomore Juju Watkins has agreed on a multi-year contract extension with Nike that will give her one of the richest shoe endorsement deals in women's basketball history. Nike officials finished discussions today on the deal with negotiations led by Clutch Sports. Let's take you to the scoreboard for baseball. Currently, it's the Mets leading the Phillies one nothing at the top of the fourth. That's your Sports Center update at the top of the hour. I'm Sebastian Perez Navarro. From the 600 ESPN El Paso River Oaks Property Schoolyard Sports Studio, here's Steve Kaplowitz and Adrian Broadus. All right, uh, Adrian, uh, as I mentioned on the show yesterday, uh, as uh, you suffered a uh, huge loss with the Broadus family, the loss of, uh, of his grandmother, and uh, he's going to be out the next couple days. Uh, however, that is uh, going to give us the opportunity to give uh, Alberto Dueta uh, a chance to fill in for him today. And we've also got, as you just heard, the aforementioned Sebastian Perez Navarro with us. And how nice we start our show on a Tuesday afternoon with Lane Frank, the host of the Schoolyard Sports Podcast. It's intercession for Lane at Coronado, but that doesn't mean he's not playing right now. A little tennis action. And uh, he's been busy with, obviously, the big news today surrounding the New York Jets this morning deciding to make a coaching change. In fact, getting rid of Robert Sala was something that I know has caught a lot of people by surprise. However, if you've watched the Jets this season, they've been a mess. They needed something to shake this team up. And they decided that uh, getting rid of their head coach, who had no idea was coming, even went into work today and then was told by Woody Johnson that he was gone, escorted out of uh, the uh, Jets' facilities. So it was a shock to him as much as it was a shock to a lot of people, but not a shock to Lane Frank, the host of the Schoolyard Sports Podcast and our weekly spot here on the program, who was in Philadelphia over the weekend watching the Mets and Phils game two. And now he's back uh, here to talk a little uh, with us here on the program. Good to see you. How you doing? Uh, we get yeah, great, yeah. To, great I, to be here. I never know what mic you're on. Like, I keep thinking that that's Shows mic me. three, this is mic. I never know what mic is what. You know, whenever so. I host the show, I don't have these issues. What's that? When I host the show, I don't have these issues, Steve. Well, first up, you're on my mic. It's mic one, and you're good to go. So I understand that. Maybe you need to host it more. You know what? I got news for you. I don't, I don't mind taking off for the next two hours and, uh, you know, leaving you uh, and Alberto and Sebastian to host. So if you, if you want it, you'll get your wish. You know, I got a little few things to do after this. You know, I got to film my own show. Got to do a few other things, and then... Pack, wake up early, go to Midland tomorrow. We'll play South Lake on Thursday. First for off, win today, big uh, win today. Give me an update on the on the the turn the uh, state tournament and how things went today for Coronado Tennis. So we won by districts today, got a nice little trophy. You know, we unfortunately lost districts to Franklin ten to nine, a little bit of a heartbreaker. But we won today against Midland High, ten to three. Good match, fun match. They're a good team, and we'll play South Lake, one of the best teams in the state, on Thursday. Good opportunity. If we win that, I mean, sky's the limit. Well, first off, congratulations. Are you still a little upset about the loss to Franklin? Did it bother you a little bit? You know, you got to move on. Second straight year of this happening, losing to Franklin, but you got to move on. All right. Well, you did, right? You moved on, and now you're moving on into the. Uh, you're going. So you, you won by district. So now you're getting ready to go into the area round of the state uh, tennis tournament. Right, and we're excited for it. Give me a preview of your opponents coming up later this week. You know, we're playing South Lake. We played them about two weeks ago. They're a really good team, and we're excited for it. Did you win against South Lake uh, two weeks ago? No, we didn't lose against, we didn't beat South Lake Carroll, but you know, we had some good competitive matches that maybe could have put us 
in a better position to win that match. So we're excited for it. They're a great school. I mean, Quinn Ewers went there. A bunch of great people went there. Good team. South Lake, great school. So you feel like you can hang with South Lake. It's not exactly like it's going to be an uphill battle. We could definitely see Coronado getting past South Lake. You know, it's playoffs. Anything can happen. So we're excited. Oh, there you go. Oh, that, you know what? You just gave me the greatest cliche answers of all time. As the host of Schoolyard Sports, don't you, like, and, and as a student athlete, aren't you ever going to, like, shed the cliche lines and start treating, you know, your performances not like every other athlete on the planet and maybe give me something fresh and different since you are a, uh, you know, a very successful host of a podcast since you're 12 years old? Are you going to throw me the same crap that every athlete always sends me uh, come this time of year? What's so bad about a media trained answer? Because I'm not even media trained. You don't even have to do that. You're not media trained. Well, yeah, you're kind of are media trained. But I mean, you you know, you could be you could be different. You could be one of those people that's like, wow, that's fresh. That's not something I'm used to. Lane's given us something useful. But no, you said it's gonna be a great battle. It's the playoffs. Yada, yada, yada. It's a playoff match. They're one of the best teams in the state. We're still a really good team. I think we have a great shot to go in there and win. That's all you have to say. There you go. Thank you. I hope so. I'm not asking for you to give me bulletin board material. After all, I mean, you know, I don't want this to go back to Southlake and all of a sudden here, hey, do you hear what they're saying on Sports Talk about our big tennis match coming up later this week? That I don't want. But, um, all right, let's get to Robert Sala for a second. Big news shook up the football world earlier today. This was something that you, you said this eight weeks ago during the preseason that you would expect if any coach was going to lose their job during the year, it would be Robert Sala first. Yeah, I said preseason. I called it. You know, nobody else can say they called it. I called it. Robert Sala would be the first head coach fired this season, and, you know, it happened. So glad to see that happen. Robert Sala, not a good coach in my eyes. Very glad that he got canned today. Yeah, and now the question is this, though. Okay, some people are already saying, wow. Look at the power Aaron Rodgers has. It, that, it wasn't Aaron Rodgers at all. No, it was Woody Johnson. Sala. Yes. What a move by Woody Johnson and Joe Douglas. Smart move, guys. Sala wasn't a good hire. Nathaniel Hackett wasn't a good hire. Put together a terrible staff, and I think I noticed that when they had the hard knocks about two years ago. Sala, I'm not going to say he's a yes man. A little bit of a yes man sometimes. Also, More his a staff, cheerleader. More he, a cheerleader. Or maybe he wanted yes men around him as his staff, so it, it didn't work out for them. Just, Nathaniel uh, Hackett's a yes man, Aaron Rodgers, and Robert Sala. So here's the thing. Okay, uh, Jeff Ulbricht a little different, wired a little different. Still came from the San Francisco 49er, uh, you know, uh, you know tree but. with with Sala, but again, they didn't try to bring Bill Belichick out of retirement and and lure him to New York after all the bad blood for years between Belichick and the Jets, going back to when he left them after four days to become Patriots head coach. We all know what happened there. So I'm interested to see if Ulbrick can turn this around, but clearly the Jets, with their game next Monday coming up against Buffalo, decided they do not want to wait around to see what happens. Yeah, the Jets need to make a move. They made a move, and have they made an interim head coach yet? Cause... Yeah, Jeff Ulbrick, the uh, yeah. defensive, uh, he was the defensive coordinator. He is now going to be their interim coach for the rest of the season. Okay, that's big so Jets like I said they put together a bad staff but you know maybe Jeff Ulberg he can do things his own way not the Robert Sala way I'm not gonna say Robert Sala is a dictator of a football coach he likes things his way so maybe Jeff Ulberg lets a little, a little more freedom around in that locker room let's be honest it has been a disaster for the Jets uh so it's been far tough for the Jets so far. it has been a very difficult start that, that lost this past week in London against the Vikings Aaron Rodgers took a beating with all the uh, offensive linemen, the Jets signed to try to re- to try to protect Aaron Rodgers. That n- it hasn't happened. Not only that, not only have they not protected Rodgers, but on the flip side, Brees Hall suddenly can't find any openings to run the football. So the offensive line is a big reason why right now the Jets have struggled out of the gate the way they have through these first five games. Are they going to pull the trigger? on a Devontae Adams trade before the end of the week. I don't see the reason not to do it, okay? Devontae Adams, he's going to be a Saint. He might still be a Raiders. He might be a Jet by the end of the week. It needs to be the Jets, in my opinion, for the New York Jets. Why not? Take on that contract. Give up a third-round pick. That's really all it's going to take because you're taking on that big contract. He's not going to be that expensive to trade for outside of taking on that contract. I don't see that why the Jets wouldn't do it. Chiefs won last night over New Orleans. A impressive four quarters of football by Kansas City. 
They remain undefeated right now. That's another storyline, I think, in the NFL because they are 5-0. and In fact, as they are 5-0, and you look at the rest of the league and uh, the Chiefs, uh, I believe, are they the only undefeated team left right now in the NFL? That could be the case. I think the Vikings too, Steve. Oh, that's right. The Vikings, yes, after beating the Jets. How could I have forgotten about the Vikings after watching what they did in London to uh, to the Jets over the weekend? No, but I say it every week. The Chiefs are good enough. They do enough. They get the job done. I say it when I pick them every week. It's not going to be a perfect game. They'll do enough. They get the win. And that's what it's been all year. By the way, Vikings, that's an impressive story. I won my bet on you already. About Sam Darnold? Sam Darnold, Kenny Pickett, I've won that bet. Yeah, you've won. When have you ever seen Kenny Pickett go on a five-game win streak? Well, first off, understand this. Sam Darnold would probably not even be quarterbacking this team right now if J.J. McCarthy was healthy and didn't get hurt. So let's at least let's at least talk about that to start things off. Can I throw a little point out there? So Sam Darnold's great. He should be the guy for the Minnesota Vikings. I still think J.J. McCarthy can have a great NFL career. They could get a first-round pick, a second-round pick if they trade McCarthy. What about maybe... San Francisco 49ers. Kyle Shanahan is a guy who would love to have J.J. McCarthy, a quarterback who can move, a quarterback who doesn't turn the football over, a quarterback with a great arm. He's stuck with Brock Purdy right now. Brock Purdy doesn't have a contract. He doesn't have a $100, 200000000 million contract yet. Do you want to move off of Brock Purdy maybe, slot J.J. in there, no. give up a second, third-round pick? What are you talking about? What about my New York Giants? What are you what, talking there's no about, risk to this. Brock He's a top-ten pick been... quarterback who but... played great in the one game we saw him in. Yeah, but look what Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy isn't gonna, gonna get it done for the 49ers. He isn't gonna get it done. He He's a game manager. He's a game year. manager. That's enough. He's a game manager. He's a what? Game manager. Oh, game. I thought he's okay. 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 So uh, thank you. By the way, um, listen. Okay, I'm not. I'm not against the McCarthy trade, but uh, Sam Darnold still makes bad throws. L- if you watch the second half of that Jet game. Sam Darnold looked at times like he had reverted back to his original Jets form. That is something that happened. And by the way, boom! Jesse Winker has just gone yard over yeah. Aaron Noah. Mets leading it two games to no- two nothing right now. Oh, by the way, as they're rocking in City Field, you were in Philadelphia over the weekend for Game Two of this series. Tell me about what. Philadelphia was like for you? Uh, best baseball game I've ever been to. Best Citizens. baseball environment I've ever been to. I mean, Citizens Bank Park. It was incredible. It's like an SEC football game before the game. You know, they literally have everybody going crazy. I've never seen that before at a baseball game. I've never seen anything outside of a football game, even out of football game. I don't know if I've seen that. It was electric. You know, it was a little bit overhyped that the fans would be rude. I think the fans were definitely very passionate. I wouldn't say very rude because the Mets were winning most of the game. So we were kind of like excited. The fans weren't getting too angry at us. And then when the Phillies take the lead, you know, they shove in your face a little, a little bit. They get they very shut. they get very excited. I mean, 10 times as excited as I was getting. So, fun game. Now, did you show up wearing Met gear? I did. What did you have on? Had a little Met shirt on, you know. I was a little bit too scared to wear a Mets jersey, but it was still fun. So, wait a minute. Now, I, I do you have a picture of yourself at the game? Take, let me see. Let me see a photo of you. I don't think I have a picture of myself at the game. How did you not take a photo of yourself at this game? It didn't happen. Didn't happen. We're around Philly fans. Who am I going to ask? All right. Now, I'm just trying because, like you're saying, you took like a Mets shirt on. Did you wear? Were you one of those fans that wore a shirt that looked neutral and then it had like this little yeah. itty bitty exactly. tiny Met logo that was okay? That's what I figured. Okay, so you you did what most fans would have said. Is that what you wore to the game? That's exactly what I wore to the game. Oh, you wore the same shirt you wore on Thursday when you were with us. Probably, yeah. That little, that, that T-shirt with that little uh, Met logo. Yeah, yeah a I understand. Me- a little bit of Met logo. Yeah, very little. Very, very little. All right. So uh, the fans were okay, though. They, they didn't threaten you with bodily harm. Nobody tried to uh, beat you up during the game like the Dodgers uh, fans uh, after that game against the Padres. All hell is broken loose in Los Angeles, by the way. Oh, I mean, it's ridiculous. You lose one game at home in the NLDS, ALDS, you're cooked, in my opinion. I said it for the Yankees. I say that for the Phillies, I say that for the Guardians, and I say that for, who else am I thinking, Dodgers. Because those teams started out at home. You're losing one at home now, okay, it's 1-1, now you have to go on the road for two straight games. Those road environments are going to be loud. You lose both those games, sayonara, see you in April. That's true. That is very true. So, winning at home is very important early on in the series. I'd almost rather be on the road first in the series. Meanwhile, Mets now with the 2-0 lead on the fills. Jesse Winker just connected live while you were on talking about the uh, experience in Philadelphia. But look, back to my question. Did anybody threaten bodily harm to you uh, either before, during, or after the game? 
I'm going to stick with the answer I told my mom, so uh, no. The answer you told your mom? No, nobody threatened me. Nobody threatened us. We were good. Yeah, sure. I believe it. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Philadelphia, playoff game. Showing up with a Met shirt on. Rooting Tying for the Mets. Six, six. Yeah, I just, uh, okay. All right. Let me see. Hang on. You don't have any shiners. That's good. No bruising. Yeah, you did okay. You came out of Philly alive. Did you eat a cheesesteak when you were in Philadelphia? Heck no. I'll tell you, you can't do that. You can't. I forgot. You keep kosher. Nah, but I wouldn't eat a cheesesteak anyway. Oh, my God. You're missing out. A couple of great ones in Philadelphia. At Shake Shack in the stadium. Shake Shack is good. Way better. Yeah, I like Shake Shack. All right. Um, All right. When we come back, are you ready to pick some more NFL games? I'm ready. I'm excited for it. I've got somebody in this building who is dying to pick against you. So this is going to be a lot of fun. We'll do that when we come back. Fun show today. We're with you till 6 o'clock. Then it's John Teicher and Utah Football with Scotty Walden coming up on 600 ESPN El Paso. Plus, we'll do Jeff Erickson at 5. little fantasy football focus as we go right now to Charlie One. Let's kick it off right. He has traffic. Back here on Sports Talk as we continue. Once again, Mets with a 2 nothing lead right now on the Phils. The man who was at Game 2 and lived to talk about it, Lane Frank, host of the Schoolyard Sports Podcast. we got 186 dropping. Ooh, Is that right? Uh, 186, yeah. 186. You're taping it tonight, huh? Taping it tonight. What are we going to be talking about during the Schoolyard Sports uh, 186? Give me, give me a rundown. Uh, of course, a little bit of baseball, playoff baseball, yeah, college yeah. football, of course. I mean, this is the best college football week. I think we've had in years, Steve. Go look at the slate. It's incredible. I know. Yeah, I'd love to be picking college football right now, too. NFL, there's a lot of great games. Can so you believe all of it? Can you believe Diego Pavia? Diego Pavia, I mean, incredible. I asked you during the break, did we ever have him on uh, when he was time in New Mexico State? No, we never did. Dang. Pavia, remember last incredible. year? Remember last year when they were winning, they wouldn't allow him to talk to the media because of that whole story about urinating on the field in the summer in Albuquerque. So yeah, he's they, a classic SEC quarterback. Yes, they hit him from everybody. They they were doing well last year, and Diego was not even available to the local media until the very end of the season. And then he takes off for Vanderbilt, and the rest is history. So. I think Diego's probably a little bit immature, maybe still, but you know that, that's the fire. That's the stuff you want in a college ball quarterback, and he played great on Saturday with swagger. Huge win, by the way, for Vandy. What do you, what's your take on taking goalposts, ripping them down, and thro- and carrying it across the street and or, and, and dumping it in the river? You like that idea? Well, this is a school that has nothing except degrees in college baseball World Series, so let them do that. Let them rip it down. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Vandy cares. They can. By the way, you know what surprised me the most about the Vanderbilt game? Do you know that the Sun Bowl holds 46,000, right? That's a sellout. Do you know the sellout in Vanderbilt's like 29,000 fans for well, an SEC team? They're remodeling their stadium right now. So it's kind of under construction. I think they're adding more seats in. But to do that, you know, they take some out during the construction time. So yeah. it's really like a construction site right now. If you go there, that's actually what it looks like, like construction gotcha. all around in, and inside the stadium a little bit. But, uh, okay. yeah. So what you're telling stadium. me is that uh, it's not it, – it, when when it's completed, you're not talking about 30,000 fans. You're talking more like the 70,000, 80,000, whatever it is. Yeah, you're talking more. Okay, that sounds good. You ready to pick games this week? I'm ready to win games this week. Really? Well, you know what? You know who else is ready to win games this week? Your opponent, uh, Daniel Paulus, who is normally right now on our partner station, 95.5 FM KLAQ, because he is on air during this time of day every day. But he happens to be uh, with us, and he is ready to not just pick against you. He's ready to take you to the woodshed this week, my friend, and and try to win, uh, win the week. You know, we appreciate him taking his time out of his day to come pick these games against me, but uh, unfortunately, you're losing. All right. We'll Dan- see what happens. Daniel- you're going down, my friend. Daniel, this is your first time picking games uh, here on our show. Is this your first? You've been on the show before. Or is this your first time? I think this is the first time I've been on the show. Uh, I know my dad has, uh, you know, name dropped me a couple times. He but, has. Uh, this is the first time actually being on the air. For sports talk. Now you're a big. Now in addition to being a big rocker on KLAQ, you're a big sports fan. Mm-hmm. And you came to me earlier and you know last week, and you're like, you know what? I'd love to go ahead and pick against Lane. You would just really enjoy that opportunity. And now yeah. here you are. You get that chance firsthand, and getting the opportunity to try to match wits with uh, with Lane. What 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 happened to you? What what went on? Uh, my sheet of games fell right next to you. Oh my god. <laughs> Well, you know, I don't know if I'm going to do really well, but uh, I will say, uh, hey, best of luck, man. GG. And uh, let's have some fun, man. Of course. You seem like you know a lot about the NFL. This will be fun. All right. Here we go. Game number one will be this Thursday. It's Mm -hmm. on Prime Video. 
We will not have it on 600 ESPN El Paso because we will be broadcasting the UTEP game Thursday night uh, against uh, Western Kentucky, where I will be in Bowling Green. So we've got 49ers, Seahawks, San Francisco 2-3. and three. They're winless on the road. Seattle's 3-2. and two. Two and one at home. It's in Lumen Field uh, in Seattle. And even though we just pick straight up winners, I like to give the spread for entertainment and information purposes only. San Francisco, three and a half point favorites. And as our special guest picker this week, Daniel, you have first honors. Uh, give us your thoughts on who you think will win. Uh, you know, even though the 49ers did lose to the Cardinals uh, on Sunday, um, Seattle's not looking that great to me. I think the 49ers are going to pull it off on the road in Seattle. I think it'll be an easy win for San Francisco. All right. Daniel says the 49ers. What about you, Lane? Seahawks had a really good start to the year, and now they've kind of fallen off in the past two games. The Niners have had a tough going. They're 2-3, and three, but you're playing up at the 12th man. And it's tough to win there. Seahawks are on the road, I think, for the past two weeks. I think they get it back this week. They get an upset win over the 49ers. And like I said, it's time to maybe reevaluate Brock Purdy a little bit. All right. Well, yeah. listen, if the 49ers go to 2-4, and four, then I could definitely see some reevaluation taking place. So we'll go to Seattle. All right. Next up, Lane, start us off on this one. It's the NFL in London, 7.30 Sunday morning. Bears hosting the Jags. It's going to be in Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. The Bears are 3-2. and two. The Jags are 1-4. and four. And Chicago, two and a half point favorites. Hey, Trevor, Lord, Trevor Lawrence finally won a game, his first win since That's last right. year at Thanksgiving. So, I mean, he, he needed a win. He hasn't won since last November. He got it 37 to 34 over the Colts. And that's not a bad team no. in the Colts. But, uh, I think the Bears get it done this week. I'll go with Caleb Williams to get the win. All right. By the way, uh, Caleb's looking better and better. And you notice, did you see one of his touchdown passes this past? It was like a little flick of the wrist, and that ball went like 40 yards on a dime, on a rope. No, Caleb's playing very well, and I think he gets the job done. What about you, Daniel? I agree. I think Chicago's got the win. Uh, Jacksonville, yeah. They finally, they're not going winless this season, but uh, I think the Bears are looking promising right now. So, yeah, I got the Bears, too. Let's go to the 11 o'clock games, and uh, we'll begin in Lambeau, where the Packers, 3-2, and 1-1 one one at home, will uh, host the Cards, 2-3, and 1-1 one one on the road. Cards, with that big road victory last week uh, against the 49ers, are five-point underdogs, Daniel, to the Pack. You know, I got the Cardinals. I picked them last week to beat the 49ers. Uh, people were looking at me like I'm kind of crazy. Like, what? Why are you picking Arizona? I just think they're an underrated team. I think they could be a shoe in for possibly uh, sneaking into the uh, playoffs, especially with the NFC West just kind of looking uh, really not, not you know, there's no clear-cut winner mm-hmm. right now. So I think the Arizona Cardinals are going to go to Lambeau Field, and they are going to get the win. Sorry, Packers. All right, Lane. Yeah, like you said, that division's struggling right now, the NFC West, and I didn't really expect that. But I think the Packers just are such a better team with Jordan Love at quarterback. I think... Malik Willis did a really good job being serviceable for them. But as Jordan Love showed out, Josh Jacobs kind of getting into a tune of things right now. I'm going to go with the Packers over the Cardinals in this one. Next up, uh, Titans and Colts. This one from Nissan Stadium in Nashville. Now, the Titans are 1-3, and three, winless at home. The Colts are 2-3, and three, also winless on the road. Somebody's going to come away a winner this weekend <laughs> with the Indy one-point favorites on the road. What do you think, Lane? I think something is wrong with the Titans quarterback's brain, and that's Will Levis. Something has just been up with him all season long. It's kind of always been like that for Will Levis. The gunslinger mentality doesn't always pay off for him, and it really hasn't at all in the NFL. I'm going to go with the Colts over the Titans. Who's quarterbacking the Colts this week? Will Richardson be back, or is it going to be uh, Flacco? Joe Flacco. I think Flacco can be a top 15, yeah. top 20 quarterback in the NFL, so I hope it's Flacco, but you know, maybe they want those reps in for Anthony Richardson, which he does <laughs> need more reps. Lane says the Colts on the road. What about you, Daniel? Yep, I'm going with the Colts as well. All right. So we have picked four games this week. We're at the bottom of the hour. More games coming up in a moment. But first, right back to Sebastian Perez Novato. He is the third member in the crew today, and he has this Sports Center update for us. Thank you, Steve. Here's your bottom of the hour Sports Center update. Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin says he doesn't question George Pickens' efforts. Though the Pittsburgh Steelers wide receiver George Pickens played a career low 34 snaps in the loss to the Dallas Cowboys on Sunday night, and he appeared to run some of his routes at less than full speed. Coach Mike Tomlin today said he didn't have a problem with the receiver's efforts. Tomlin also explained that Pickens' workloads reduction is as a part 
part of snap management strategy. I didn't have any outlying issues with his effort, Tomlin said. As I mentioned after the game, that's just a snap management thing in an effort to be more productive. Let's move on to baseball. The Padres have warned fans about abusive behavior ahead of Game 3 versus the Dodgers. The Padres have reminded fans about their zero-tolerance policy for bad behavior ahead of Game 3 of their National League Division Series against the rival, the Los Angeles Dodgers which turned continuous Sunday night when tempers flared on the field and in the stands at Dodger Stadium. Game 2 was delayed for 12 minutes after rowdy fans tossed baseballs in the direction of San Diego left fielder Jurickson Profar. Let's move on to basketball as Cynthia Marshall is retiring as the CEO of the Mavericks at the end of 2024. The Chief Executive Officer Marshall has announced she planned to retire on December 31st. My three-year commitment has more than doubled in time, said Marshall. Let's take it to the scoreboard. Currently, it's the Mets up 2 nothing over the Phillies at the top of the six. News that make Lane and Steve very happy. That's your Sports Center update for the bottom of the hour. I'm Sebastian Perez Navarro. And uh, as we see, Sean Manaya still dealing right now for the Mets uh, with that 2 nothing lead, top six. We'll see if it'll hold when the bullpen gets in. New York can get a two games to one lead. We've got games we're picking right now in the NFL. We normally do this later in the week, but as we mentioned earlier, we're not even on tomorrow. we got baseball all day, so there'll be no sports talk tomorrow. Uh, it is all playoff day, and then just an hour on Thursday. So we decided let's bring Lane here early before he tapes schoolyard sports, and uh, we get ready for game number five between Lane and this week's guest uh, picker, Daniel Paulus from our partner station, 95. 55 FM KLAQ. All right, gentlemen, here we go. Daniel, you will lead us off with the Texans and the Pats. It's going to be an 11 o'clock game, probably a local game, I would think, from Gillette Stadium in Foxborough. The Texans are 4 and 1, 1 and 1 on the road. The Pats are 1 and 4, 0 oh and 2 at home. Houston, seven point favorites. I got the Houston Texans. Uh, I think this is going to be an easy win for the Texans, and you know what? I'm going to make a bold prediction really, really early in the season. Mm -hmm. I think not only are they going to have the AFC South, I think they could be a shoe-in for the AFC Championship game. Wow. All right. So you like the Texans that much. Very interesting. Aside aside from my Steelers, yes, they are my pick, uh, one of them at least, (laughs) for the AFC. So, yeah, I'm going with the Texans here. Lane, uh, the Pats are turning to Drake May this week as the starting quarterback. Will that have any impact with the Texans coming to town? Yeah, the Pats are making a lot of changes this week. Antonio Gibson is going to be the starting running back. Drake May is going to be the starting quarterback. Maybe we see a few more things in there. They'll have a new starting safety. It doesn't look like Jabril Peppers will play this week with his off-the-field issues this week. But uh, I'm going to go with Houston in this one. A really good team up in Foxborough. You need these road wins, and I think it's fun to get a road win. Up on the East Coast, go down to Texas on the way back. That'd be fun for them. Texans over the Patriots. Excellent. Um, Alberto, can you throw me some of that NFL primetime music? I love that in the background. It gives me a little more uh, excitement. <laughs> that, when I, it sets the mood, man. Yeah, it does. I mean, I feel like uh, the old days with Chris Berman. Um, and then you had yeah. uh, just uh, that whole crew. Uh, it was always a lot of fun. And All right, here we go. <laughs> Bucks and Saints. We've got a few more early games left. This one's going to be at Caesars Superdome in New Orleans. The Saints coming off that loss last night are two and three, one and one at home. The Bucks are three and two, one and one on the road. And Lane, uh, uh, Tampa, three and a half point road favorites in this one. I'll say this right here. The Saints started out the year as one of the best teams in the NFL, and now it's kind of collapsing a little bit. To salvage this earlier great part of the season they had, to bring it back, to be a good team this year, make that trade for Devonta Adams, and do it now. If I'm Mickey Loomis or Dennis Allen, I'm doing it right now. I don't think they do it this week, and they're not going to get the win this week. I'm going to go with the Buccaneers over the Saints. Buccaneers, tough loss last week to the Falcons, and they're a really good team. So I'm going to go with the Buccaneers over the Saints, two losses this year, one to the Broncos, one to the Falcons, but they get done, Buccaneers over the Saints. All right, what do you think, uh, Daniel? I think Lane's are the best. Uh, I got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, too. Uh, that NFC South typically looked pretty tough at the beginning of the season, but, yeah, it's kind of becoming more of like a Tampa-Atlanta race right now. But, yeah, I, I got the uh, I got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers over the New Orleans Saints. I know there are some Saints fans out there. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, but I got to go with Tampa on this one. 
Daniel, we'll stay with you uh, back in uh, Philly in Lincoln Financial Field. It'll be the 2-2 two and two Eagles hosting the 1-4 and four Browns. Cleveland has just been mostly awful this whole season. 1-2 and two on the road. Eagles are 1-1 one and one at home, and they're also 9-point favorites over Cleveland. Yep, I got the Eagles for this one, too. And I'm not just saying that because I, <laughs> I got to go against every a- AFC North team. Now Philly's just looking like a better team right now. Yep. I-, I don't know what happened with Cleveland last year. Last year they were in the playoffs, and this year they're just really struggling. Maybe it's Joe Flacco that they need him back. I, I think that's a lot. There's a lot that has to say with that. What about uh, what about you right now? Lee? I fully agree with the point about Joe Flacco, but I still think they have a really good quarterback. <laughs> I still think they have a really good quarterback on the bench, and that's Jameis Winston. Jameis Winston yeah. deserves another chance in the NFL to be a starting quarterback. He should be a starter for this team, but he isn't and isn't this week. Let's go Philadelphia, a coach that maybe needs to save his job. We see today, Robert Sala, nobody's safe in the NFL. Nick Sirianni maybe needs that little bit of a life check right here. I'm going to go with the Eagles over the Browns. Again, nice win. Do you? Th- Sorry, I didn't mean to butt in, but if Jamin Winston plays for the Browns this week instead of Watson, do you think they have a chance? I don't think they have a chance yet. I think they still have to wait till Chubb gets back later in the year. Yeah, that's a good point. Next up lane, it'll be the Ravens hosting the Commanders. This will be a fun one. Good battle between two teams in close proximity to each other. Commanders have been the early surprise right now in the NFL. Four and one, two and one on the road, while the Ravens three and two, one and one at home, and Baltimore a six and a half point favorite. This is the same situation I think the Ravens might have been last year. Three and two, then they play a team in Detroit that was riding high, having a great year, and they smacked them in their mouth, put them in their place. I think that happens this year. The Ravens smack the Commanders. Put them in their place. They're a good team, the Commanders. They're off to a great start, but they're not ready to be with the big boys yet. Let's go with the Ravens smacking down on the Commanders at home. What do you think, Daniel? There's valid points. Really valid points. Uh, but I'm sorry, Baltimore, but i got to pick against you. I'm going with the Washington Ooh. Commanders. I am. I think J- Jamin Daniels, right? That's his name? Jamin yep. Daniels. Jamin Daniels. Uh, yeah. I think uh, he, he might be what Washington really needs, especially... Over these last couple of seasons, they're just kind of really mid to just poor. But I think Washington will pull an upset. I think they will beat the Baltimore Ravens, uh, Ravens bring them down to a 3-3. Yeah, I got Washington in this one. All right, four late games. We'll start it off with the Chargers-Broncos from Denver and Empower Field at Mile High. Chargers are 2-2, two and 1-1 two, one one on the road. Broncos are 3-2, and 1-1 one one at home. Daniel, Chargers three-point road favorites in this one. I got the Broncos on this one. I think Bo Nix, yeah, he, they got, you know, a two game winning streak. That's really good. But look, I think the real test for the Broncos are going to be when they face off against the Chiefs later on this season. But uh, I think this should be an easy win for them. I think they're going to get the W in Denver. I got the Broncos. All right. What about you, Lane? I think this Broncos team has had a few lucky wins. This offense really hasn't been tested much yet. And now they're going up against Jesse Minter, one of the best defense coordinators in the game. Jim Harbaugh uh, for bye week. I mean, this team's ready. Mets just got a big out. I hope the Chargers bring that enthusiasm the Mets just brought. Let's go Chargers over the Broncos. How'd you like that uh, little battle between Bo Nix? Bo Nix and Sean Payton? You know, Sean oh, Payton, yeah. Sean, <laughs> Bo Nix said, you know, I told him I love him, and then he said that back. That's all that That's all that conspired in that conversation right there. Yeah, exactly. Just like I don't know if I believe him, Steve. I don't know either. What do you think? I don't tend to say yeah, it depends. Bo Nix is a nice guy. You know, Bo Nix from Alabama. Competitive guy. guy. I Good like guy. that. I wouldn't see Bo Nix going crazy. All right. Raiders and Steelers are next. Raiders are 2-3, and 1-1 one one in Vegas. Steelers are 3-2, and 2-1 two, two and one on the road. It's going to be at Allegiant Stadium. And Lane, Pittsburgh, three-point road favorites. Yeah, Raiders are collapsing a little bit. Steelers need a win right here. Starting out the year 3-0, and losing their last two games. I'm going to go Pittsburgh over the Raiders. Raiders, like I said, they're a mess. Their best player in offense right now is Brock Bowers, and he's playing a position that's dying in the NFL. Gardner Minshew has not been a good quarterback at all this year, and O'Connor really isn't a good option either. So I'm going to go to the Steelers over the Raiders. What do you think? Uh, picking with your uh, heart and your head or one or the other? What are you going to do? Oh, I'm definitely picking with my heart. That's... Yeah, you got that one on the money. But, yeah, no, honestly, uh, even though we lost to the Colts and the Cowboys, uh, I think we do have a chance against the Raiders. Um, i got to say, I, I saw that game last year. It was amazing. What's this we talk? You don't play for Pittsburgh. What do you mean we? <laughs> we? What's wrong about saying we? Because I've talked to you about this, sir. I've given you the whole stuff. I've given you the whole thing. Um, do, you own, <laughs> do, you own, do you own stock in the Steelers? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Uh, do you um, do you have anything to do with Pittsburgh from a we standpoint, or are you just a fan? Oh, I'm a diehard fan, and, and okay. that really comes back to my grandmother too. She was a diehard fan. My mom's a diehard fan, so it's really so just, just so hard. Just it's not that passion. Call you know? them the Steelers, just the Steelers, not we. All right, fine. Us, I. All right, fine. The Steelers. This. 
the Steelers. All We're right. going to get the win. He said, in, he said it again. Said We're going to get the win. You just did it. Steelers beating Raiders. All there right. Okay, yeah. I would try to We're not say win. we. We're not picking the Giants. If I'm picking the Giants. Yeah, good luck <laughs> with that one. Uh, before we get to that game, we have the Lions and the Cowboys, Daniel. Cowboys are 3-2, and two, winless at home. Lions are 3-1, and 1-0 one, one and oh on the road. It's going to be at AT&T. And the Lions, three-and-a-half-point road favorites. I got the Lions on this one. And it's not just because the Cowboys, uh, you know, beat us, but I, the Steelers, us. sorry, uh-huh. the Steelers. Hey. No, honestly, realistically, the Lions, they're proving that last season was not just a fluke. I think they got the, uh, Jared Goff. They're firing on all cylinders. They are going to go to AT&T Stadium. I think they are going to get the win. Okay. So I got the Lions. Uh, the Lions got hooked harder than a high school tennis player last year when they played the Cowboys. And that means they got cheated because they got cheated last year versus the Cowboys. They said that was the offensive line most Dan Skipper didn't sub in to be a receiver, even though he actually did. And then Jared Goff threw him the game winning touchdown. They called it back for the penalty. That shouldn't have happened. Then they ended up losing that game. I think the Lions get what they deserve right here, and that's a win in Dallas over the Cowboys. Ooh, that, that's right. That's right. It's a rematch it is. of Week 17 last year. All this right. going to be a good one. Three to go. Falcons, Panthers are next, Lane. Panthers are one and four, winless at home. Falcons are three and two, one and oh on the road. And as you would expect, Atlanta a six point favorite. And as you would expect, I'm picking Atlanta in this one. Really, really good team. Great offense. Love this offense right now with Kirk Cousins going. Let's go with Atlanta over the Panthers. I like the structure of this franchise. You have a great quarterback right now in Kirk Cousins. And in three years, you hand the keys to Michael Pax Jr. Okay. Yep. I gotta go with Lane on this one. I got the Falcons too. Just like I said. You know, NFC North looking real tough right now between Tampa and Atlanta. That's going to be a fun match. NFC I got South, right? South. NFC yeah. South, sorry. Yes. Okay. Well, sorry, the <laughs> North is confused. tough, too, because the North, you got Detroit, you got Green Bay, you got Minnesota. The, the North yeah. is, and Chicago, it's stacked right now. Oh, right. yeah. Uh, here we go. Sunday night game, Bengals Giants. This one from MetLife in East Rutherford. Uh, Giants are two and three, zero oh and two at home. Bengals are one and four, one and one on the road. Cincinnati, three and a half point favorites over the G-Men. Yeah, and you know it's funny the Bengals. Um, even though they got some tough losses, there are some games like, against the Chiefs and the Ravens that prove that yeah they still got it. They don't have it entirely, but I think against the Giants. Sorry, man, I do have to pick the Bengals to win uh, against the Giants. All right, Lane. Joe Burrow has twelve touchdowns, just two interceptions, and they're one and four on the season. Will they win their second game? It's a really tough ride so far for the Bengals, and they played really well last week, and I think they played really well against the Commanders. I think they played decently well in defense against the Patriots. Those three games, they definitely should have won. Even the Chiefs game, they should have won. Maybe the refs you know, helped out the Chiefs a little bit in that one. But Giants have been playing well. Daniel Jones played well last week up in Seattle. Let's go win on the road. That Seahawks probably should have won that game at home. But as you know, I'm not biased. I think the Cincinnati Bengals deserve a win. They need a win. I think they get a win right here over the Giants. Monday night, Bills Jets. That'll wrap us up from MetLife. Buffalo two and a half point road favorites. They're three and two, one and two on the road. The Jets are two and three, one and one at home. New coach. Will there be a new result or will it be the same old Jets lane? Bills have actually been very bad in the last two weeks, in my opinion. I think that keeps going right here. Jets, low bit mojo right now. New head coach. What's his name again? Their defense coordinator? Jeff Olbrick. Jeff Olbrick. Good one right here. Aaron Rodgers. They play well. They win it for Robert Sala. Nope. They win it for Jeff Olbrick. There win you go. over the Bills. What do you think? I got the Bills on this one, uh, but I'm not 100% on this one, if I'm being completely honest. You know, okay. the Bills well, are not just, eh, they're looking okay. The good it, news is you guys both picked uh, five games different, so we do not need a tiebreaker because that means we will have a winner between the two of you. I'm excited about that. Oh, I'm excited too. Lane, good luck, man. Good luck. That was great picking against you. Awesome. Yeah, that was great. Look, uh, picking against you too, man. Enjoy it, Daniel. That was fun. Lane, you got uh, your taping tonight. You got the Mets coming up. Padres, Dodgers should be a lot of fun. Let's win. Let's go two and one, and then maybe Padres get a nice win. Maybe we'll have a Mets Padres series. Good luck in area this weekend. Uh, later this weekend, uh, we'll check you back here on the show. Appreciate, it, guys. Thank you. You got it. Thank All you. All right, man. there he is, Lane Frank, Daniel Paulus. As we wrap up hour one, we'll come back with more in a moment. Stay with us. Six hundred ESPN El Paso. All right, listen, if the Mets are going to win this game tonight, this is it. They're already up 2 nothing on the Phils. Bases loaded, nobody out in the bottom of the six for the Mets. They could just tack on a few extra insurance runs so that when Diaz blows it in the eighth or ninth, they're going to be fine. That's the key right now as a Mets fan. I'm telling you, here's my here's my best advice with Diaz. Do not ask him to pitch more than one inning and just let him get out there and finish the night. But when you send him out and try to get two innings or, or more of work, it's just a recipe for disaster. 
So, and I wouldn't even be upset if David Peterson would be my uh, my closer. He, he's he's kind of a nice change of pace to what uh, we haven't seen. Doesn't throw as hard, but gets out. But the Mets, bases loaded, have an opportunity to try and uh, finish the job here in Game 3 against the Phils. Later tonight, it's going to be uh, the Padres and the Dodgers. Matter of fact, that's going to be coming up a little bit later on 600 ESPN El Paso. Since uh, we've got UTEP football with Scotty Walden, John Teicher, he's going to be live from where I was yesterday. I was at Porter City L House yesterday. He's going to be there in an hour. That's right, 1506 Lee Trevino. Big show tonight because UTEP leaving for Bowling Green, Kentucky tomorrow. And then Thursday, that game will kick off right here on 600 ESPN El Paso, beginning at 5 o'clock with the countdown to kick off, and then game gets underway at 6 o'clock on uh, Thursday night. So a lot going on with UTEP football uh, starting tonight with the coaches' show. So, yeah, excited about that. In the meantime, uh, we've got a little fantasy talk coming up next with uh, Jeff Erickson. So if you've got fantasy questions for your leagues, this is the time to get into the show and send it to us. 600 ESPN El Paso on Twitter and X. If you want to you know, get your thoughts on how Drake May might do against the Texans in his debut, Jeff will have that and uh, everything else uh, we were going to be talking about uh, here uh, coming up to begin Hour 2 of uh, the show. In the meantime, uh, we've got more of your phone calls coming in. 505-6009, our telephone number, and 600 ESPN El Paso on Twitter and X. So stay with us. We continue right here. 600 ESPN El Paso. Well-deserved uh, days away to be with his family. We've got Alberto Urueta with us today and Sebastian Perez Novato. That is our team. And because uh, we would have no show tomorrow, thanks to Major League Baseball and baseball all day, and then just an hour on Thursday with UTEP football playing uh, and getting ready for their game against Western Kentucky, that gives us the opportunity to move our weekly chat with uh, Jeff Erickson from rotawire.com from Wednesday to today. And eventually, I am going to press line two hard enough where I'm, there we go. I swear to God, um, I spent an hour at the gym on Saturday, and apparently I didn't work my fingers hard enough to push down line two so we could say hello <laughs> to Jeff from Rotowire. Welcome back. It's great to see you. And I got to tell you something. The phones we have here are about as old as we are. So that might give you a little clue into uh, why, you know, punching you up on the board sometimes is so difficult. No problem at all. Uh, sending a shout out to Adrian. Hope uh, he and his family are doing as best as they can. Well said. Hey, by the way, um, Mets are up 4 nothing over the Phils here. What a performance from uh, uh, Sean Manai, who's still in right now. He's in the seventh inning with two outs. He has been dealing, and uh, he's made it look easy so far. Jeff, he hasn't pitched. He hasn't had more than 17 pitches in an inning, and he has been in total control for the Mets uh, here in Game 3. Yeah, sure has. Uh, you know, and the Phillies made it easy on him here in the seventh, too. Uh, a lot of early swings, but, uh, you know, there was an anecdote earlier in the season that, uh, why is he successful? He's watched, he watched how Chris, uh, Chris Sale threw his slider and said, I'm going to be like Chris Sale. Well, that's a, that's a good guy to emulate. A great guy to emulate as long as he can stay healthy. Unlike poor Chris Sale, how sad is that? He has a Cy Young-like season for the Braves this season. You could say he was the Cy Young winner in the National League, um, and then all of a sudden he injures himself at the very end, can't pitch when they need him the most, and unfortunately for uh, Sale and the Braves, their season ends in the uh, wild card round. Yeah, I can't answer the bell, unfortunately, there, and... Yeah, tough, uh, tough, tough finish there. And the season there where, I mean, they were going to be up against it, even with Sale uh, going against the Padres. But, yeah, you give, give them Sale and Freed as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, who, who they had to roll out, you know, Johnny Holstaff in game one against the Padres because of the way it's it shaped out. It, you know, it's definitely very tough on them there. So, uh, yeah, um, it's still uh, – they, they still won the trade, at least uh, for certainly this year. We'll see if Vaughn Grissom has big years later in the year, uh, yeah, big seasons later in his career, but certainly it was a big win for the Braves this year. Meanwhile, as you look at the way these, uh, wa- you know, the wild card series now have turned into the divisional series, how surprised are you that in the American League, the Yankees are the only non AL Central team still alive? You know, uh, it was a bit shocking to see the Tigers go down to Houston and take two, out of, you know, two in a row there. Uh, and see the Orioles uh, get swept by the uh, you know, the Royals and 
not even uh, really get much run scoring. I think they scored what one run. Um, yep. You know, a pretty impressive performance by that Royals pitching staff, by the Tigers pitching staff. Uh, we saw Tarek Skubal yesterday uh, get it done against the uh, Guardians. Um, we saw the the Kerry Carpenter huge shot. You know, the Tigers they 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 caught fire and they remain on fire. They do. They absolutely do. All right. And as far as the uh, series in your backyard, uh, Dodgers Padres shifting now to San Diego for games three and four. What do you think? You think the uh, Padres can uh, can try to end this thing in San Diego, or do you th- see this going the full distance? I can see them winning it here. They've got the starting pitcher advantage over the uh, Dodgers, uh, although Joe Musgrove's injury complicates things for them. So game four might be actually pretty tough for them still. So uh, that, that that part might be very challenging, but you gotta got to be impressed. I mean, this is, you know, another team that just caught fire, and uh, they, they are probably the hottest team going into the playoffs, and that continues. And there, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of hate in that rivalry with the Dodgers, too. There sure is. All right, uh, moving over to football. I think your value meter will probably come out sometime tomorrow in advance of the uh, games uh, this Thursday. But we've seen the fallout. We saw the injury yesterday to a car for New Orleans, and it looks like he is now going to be missing uh, multiple games, potentially, with that oblique injury. Not really what uh, some fantasy owners wanted because he was off to a great start, uh, Derek Carr, uh, to begin the year in uh, New Orleans. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, we saw, you know, in, in the case of uh, Carr, you know, last night notwithstanding, uh, you know, a different offense. Although last night the Chiefs thoroughly dominated that game. They basically doubled the Saints' uh, total yards in that game. Uh, Carr had one dime to Rashid Shahid, and it looked like he was kind of, you know, had a cup, you know, a couple other good throws. He also had a couple of Derek Carr mind bendingly bad throws, too. So. Uh, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B for him. But they're now talking about maybe using Spencer Rattler as the starter. We, you know, Rattler, who was the third quarterback inactive, just the emergency quarterback last night, uh, he might get the start uh, is the latest I'm seeing. I'm sure that will play out over the course of the week. We'll find out pretty soon uh, whether it, whether it's he or whether it's uh, whether it's Jake Hayner who got the uh, subbed in late for Carr. But, um yeah, it's a big blow, um, and it's a you know ill time too. They got a big divisional game at home this week against the Bucks. The Bucks were a pass funnel last week against the Falcons. This could have been a pretty good start for Carr. You know, we don't know what we're going to see out of the kids though. I saw Jake Hayner a couple of years ago in the New Mexico Bowl against UTEP when he was playing with Fresno State. So, um, you know, it's hard to believe that that was what that- ball in motion there. But uh, point is. He was once really highly thought of there, so we'll see what happens. All right. Uh, meanwhile, other big uh, quarterback news. Drake May will be taking over the Pats as a starting quarterback. I would have to assume that when the value meter could probably be somewhere in, what, that 25 to 30 range? Yeah, keep in mind we only have 28 this week, uh, you know, with uh, four teams on bye. Uh, and he currently, I've got him listed at 27. Yeah. Only uh, whoever starts for the Raiders will be below him. I actually have uh, Rattler ahead of uh, Drake May right now just because of the matchup. I don't really like this matchup against the uh, – I, 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 I don't like the matchup there for um, May against the Texans there. I think that's a pretty tough spot for him. It is. But I guess if you're going to make a move, uh, time to get uh, your big boy pants on, and let's see what you can do going up against uh, one of the better teams in the league. Exactly. Exactly right. right. Meanwhile, um, Aaron Jones, week to week with that hip injury. It's interesting because I thought with Chandler running the offense and the running game, Minnesota just didn't have that same explosiveness in the second half like we saw in the first half before Jones went down after making that acrobatic catch uh, in the first uh, first quarter. Yeah, that's right. Although, in fairness, I think you have to kind of grade on the curve. They're facing a, a pretty tough Jets defense. Yeah. You know, we saw a lot of chaos in New York today, but none of it really has to do with the defense. Yeah, they could they could generate a little bit more of a pass rush, but the, the defense isn't the issue there, obviously. It's the offense and how it's just grinding into the muck. Uh, but... Yeah, I, I do think that this offense was a little worse. And keep in mind that uh, you know we saw in the case of, yeah, we, we saw a little bit of the case there too, uh, where Sam Darnold got banged up, left for a play, came back in, but he wasn't really the same after that either. They they were firing pretty well early on in that game, not so much later on. That's so true. Uh, but if Jones uh, is going to miss time, I guess having a bye this week will really help him and the Vikings give him that extra week to heal. So now Jones gets yeah. essentially two weeks instead of one. Yeah, they did say multi-week injury. That could be two. 
uh, that is more than one. Uh, so that means he could only miss one game. Maybe, perhaps. We'll, we'll see about that one. Uh, it's interesting. Some of the major injuries are, are players on teams uh, going into bye, whether it's Devin A. Chan with the concussion, whether it's Aaron Jones with the hip. Um, that, that at least uh, gives us a little bit of time there for uh, the teams to react. The, the, the really bad one there is for the Saints. It's it's so true. And as we continue with uh, Jeff Erickson from rotowire.com, it's a perfect opportunity for us to talk about your colleague, Kevin Payne, and his week six waiver wire pickups and some of the guys to maybe go after. Let's begin with uh, Tyrone Tracy and what you saw from the Giants uh, rookie running back this past weekend. Boy, he looked good. Uh, really good. Now, keep in mind, Seattle has been a run funnel. Uh, the two weeks in a row now, opposing running backs really crushed against them. But one of those was the Giants, uh, and, and Tracy. And, you know, he, he had a little bit more juice to him, uh, than, certainly than Eric Gray, who actually, you know, coughed up a fumble, and uh, coughed up a fumble on the kickoff earlier this season, uh, too. Uh, and, and even perhaps more than Devin Singletary. I'm curious to see what the distribution will be once Singletary comes back from the groin injury. But I think Tracy is, Viable. I, I, I would I would pref, I would prioritize Tank Bigsby on the Jaguars over uh, Tracy right now, but I think it's pretty close. All right. As far as receivers go, a lot of people are talking about Josh Downs because he has had a terrific amount of rapport with the backup quarterback Joe Flacco. However, we just don't know if that'll continue once Anthony Richardson returns. Yeah, you know, keep in mind some of this is because Downs was hurt early in the season too. Remember, he suffered a high ankle sprain in training camp. Uh, he was turning heads before that, uh, so Richardson didn't have the time to kind of build that rapport. Like, uh, and, and you know, Flacco kind of parachuted it in at the right time. Also happened to do it against the Jacksonville Jaguars secondary, one of the worst secondaries in football. So I think that has something to do with it too. Um, nonetheless, uh, yeah, Downs is, Downs is super uh, super talented. We saw him kind of break out a little bit last year. Definitely go grab him if he happens to still be available in your league. Well, and there's one other name I want to bring up, too, and that's uh, you know Juju Smith-Schuster of Kansas City. Kevin talks about him, especially with Rice out for the season. You tell me, do you think Schuster is somebody that uh, will have an opportunity to maybe help pick up the slack for Kansas City? Um, yeah, I think I think we kind of maybe missed his best game. Um, I think he, you know, I, I, you know, I think he's kind of similar to the, he's the Luis Matos of baseball. Whereas he had his best best game, best week when he was on the waiver wire, and you know, very few leagues was he actually active for people. Uh, but I think he could be a wide receiver three, a flex option uh, when when you have other options on by. I think he's not someone I would put in my top thirty five. That's fair. I, I think that's a, probably a, a pretty realistic uh, way to look at it. But then again, top thirty-five is also. I mean, that's a it's a good core. It's you know sometimes yeah. when you go past that list, that's really when you're gambling and hoping that maybe somebody that uh, you know could still be getting their share of targets kind of uh, takes takes advantage of the matchup and 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 uh, right. helps carry your fantasy team a little bit. So yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think that's definitely how you have to play that. Uh, you know, the Saints had a key injury in the secondary uh, last night. I think that helped Juju a lot. Uh, also, uh, I, I, I just think that this was a game where kind of the, the planets aligned properly. I think he's got some, he's got some skill. He also got drilled on, uh, at the goal line and caught, it was kind of coughed up that ball that led to the interception in the end zone, too. So just keep in mind, it wasn't a perfect night for him either. Uh, but he found, he found a lot of gaps. Um, and, Opportunity is there. We just found out that it's confirmed Rasheed Rice is out for the rest of the season. Yep. So, uh, you know, the, the opportunity will continue to be there. No Hollywood Brown, no Rice. Um, they're they're going to have to kind of patch it together for a while. Even when Pacheco comes back behind, and running back, I mean, that's not where they've been hurting as much. Cream Hunt has been a capable fill-in. Um, you know, I, I think it's they really need that, that pass catcher. And I think at least we demonstrated it was him and not uh, Justin Watson or anybody else. Xavier Worthy will get more targets some time, some other times, but I, I think we kind of saw that he's not he, he's not a full route tree guy already. Nico Collins hurts himself after the touchdown catch of sixty seven yards in the win over Buffalo. Uh, what do you think? Do you think uh, Collins uh, will be able to go this week for Houston, or do you think that that hammy could uh, hold him back? I think it's unlikely. I mean, D'Amico Ryan said it was week to week, so that usually implies you're not going to play this week. Um, so it's it's a hamstring injury. 
It was interesting. I kept watching the highlights, looking for the moment there where he hurt himself, and I didn't, never saw it. It was it was, it was wild. Uh, but sure enough, there you saw him limping back, limping back to the locker room uh, afterward. Didn't even play a single play after that. There has Jalen Tolbert turned the corner for Cowboy fans in terms of fantasy usage. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of something that was hinted at in training camp. Remember when CD was holding out? Uh, Tolbert turned heads in training camp, got drew a lot of praise. Now that Brandon Cooks, Brandon Cooks is on IR, I mean, Tolbert's going to get, you know, a decent number of snaps. He actually uh, saw the field two more snaps than C.D. Lamb did last week, but those were like blocking plays, so I'm not really concerned about Lamb or anything. Mm-hmm. But Tolbert's in the in circle of trust. In fact, you know, Cowboys made sure they uh, called the timeout before the game-winning fourth down play, making sure Tolbert was in. And sure enough, he got the play. So we'll watch his practice status this week. Because remember, he got banged up a little bit there. Uh, we'll see uh, if he's limited in practice at all this week. But yeah, I, they got a shootout game against Detroit this week. Totals in like the, the low fifties. Uh, they're expect this is expected to be a game where they're going to have to throw a lot of passes. A little bit of a coming out party for T. Higgins in that loss to Baltimore. A couple of touchdown uh, receptions, eighty three yards on nine uh, on nine catches. And Higgins is another one because of injuries starting out the season slow. Now that Jamar Chase is back and productive, you wonder what kind of an impact that's going to have on Higgins. Yeah, he's going to get targeted a lot, and the Bengals can't stop anybody. So <laughs> you know, there'll be plenty of volume. Face the Giants on Sunday night. Um, I actually think, you know, I, I, it's, I think it's going to be a challenge for the Bengals. So this will, I, I think any, pretty much any team can move the ball against them. Carolina moved the ball readily against them. So I think it's going to, the, the Bengals offense, fortunately, is flowing very well. Uh, I, they got cowardly in overtime after that fumble return. I think they should have thrown a couple more times. They, instead, they played for the 55 yard field goal, which is just crazy. Um, you know, I know kickers are really good these days, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong, as we saw in that gate loss to the Ravens. So I think that maybe they'll learn from that there and may go for the kill next time. Um, despite the uh, coaching change in New York, unless you own Garrett Wilson, it has been a disappointment for all Jets uh, players offensively as far as fantasy goes. Are you fading everybody, including Brees Hall, just based on how this team is performing with that game against Buffalo coming up uh, on Monday? Yeah, it, it's pretty tough uh, not to. I, I think I'm there. There's still got to be some sort of buy low window, but the problem is, I mean, I don't think they removed the problem. Um, I think Nathaniel Hackett's a bigger problem. I think Aaron Rodgers is a bigger problem than Robert Sala was for the offense. It's, it's not like Sala's drawing up the plays. Um, I, hey, he's he's not the reason why they had problems uh, blocking in that offensive line. I am worried, you know, about Brees Hall. I got. I think he's in principle he should be a buy low. I mean, let's face it, the talent level shouldn't have changed that much from last year to this year, unless the, he's hiding an injury. Um, which makes me think that, you know, he's going to have his day. Uh, guys usually don't drop off the map that quickly, that young. So uh, unless the, the, unless there's a hidden underlying re, re, reason there. So I, I, I would almost think out of principle you should try to buy low on Brees Hall. Yeah, I agree. And by the way, if you've been listening to some of the news around, uh, you know, around the game right now, it sounds like uh, Todd Downing, who was the offensive coordinator with the Titans and before that the Raiders, could be soon calling plays for Nate Hackett with the Jets. That would be interesting. Um, you know, any change is probably a good one at this point. Yeah, I know. And by the way, um, Downing was a disaster. So I, with the Titans, I, I don't mean is that yeah, is that what true. you is <laughs> that what you want? <laughs> I mean, how do, how have the Jets? How do they have two people that are so maligned as their your potential offensive play callers? That's what blows my mind. Yeah, let, let's just dig up Adam Gaze again while yeah. we're at it. Let's just go crazy, folks. Tell me a little bit about what you've got going on right now at rotowire.com, Jeff. So we're going to be uh, posting that value meter. It goes up overnight, basically Tuesday nights, West Coast time. Um, I, I do the ranking for the, by players by position for the given week. Uh, you mentioned Kevin Payne's article. Thank you for doing that. Uh, Kevin's also crushing it in our staff picks article uh, that we do where we pick every game against the spread every week. Uh, he's off to a tremendous start there. Uh, we've got, uh, we'll have a deeper cut waiver wire by Dan Marcus tomorrow. Uh, we got, uh, Jerry Donabedian's, uh, you know, snap count, uh, routes run article for receivers. Uh, always some really good deep dive stuff there from him. You can check it all out. Rotowire.com slash free. Get your free peek behind the paywall. No credit card at all required.
Good stuff as always. Appreciate you coming on early this week because of all of our other commitments. Jeff, we'll try to get back to normal again with you next week, all right? Sounds great. Thanks, Steve. Jeff Erickson, folks, from rotowire.com. As we continue, follow him on Twitter and X at Jeff underscore Erickson. 21 past. We'll get you right up to UTEP football with Scotty Walden and check in with John Teicher about 25 minutes from now when he's live at Border City Hill House, 1506 Lee Trevino. But first, right back to Charlie One for this traffic update. 26 past the hour. As we continue right now, Sebastian's going to have Sports Center here at the bottom of the hour, along with Alberto Dueta and the aforementioned Sebastian Perez Novato. I'm Steve Kaplowitz. Guys, want to get your take on what the NCAA uh, Division One Council voted on today? So they shortened the transfer portal windows for FBS and FCS football, as well as men's and women's basketball. The NCAA announced that today. So here's what's interesting: the total number of days that players in FBS and FCS can enter the portal is now down from 45 to 30 days. But they did preserve the spring transfer window. So here's what they're going to do. They're going to have a 20-day winter transfer window from December 9th, which is the Monday after conference championship games, through the 28th of December. And then a 10-day spring window from April 16th through the 25th. Now, the reason why they decided to keep the spring window rather than, than eliminate it is because they're going from 85 to 101, 105 uh, roster limits in football. So they feel that that'll, you know, change roster management and also uh, team revenue sharing budgets this offseason. So they want to go ahead and keep that 10 day spring window in the portal. And the 20 day window in the, uh, the winter session. So thoughts on that guys, uh, go into 30 days. Alberto, I'll, I'll start with you. Then I'll get to Sebastian. Um, is this good for the sport? And ultimately, you know, making it just 30 days, you don't have forever to decide if you're going to get into that portal or not. Yeah, I think it's a good decision in trying to, you know, regulate a, a unregulated area of uh, college sports, which desperately needs help. But just I'm kind of curious as how it's going to work, because I, I don't understand how really the transfer window works now. If As we've seen in college football, guys are entering the transfer portal four games into their season. So I'm kind of curious how that's going to play into effect and and and, and how it's going to work, really, because well, as of now, guys are just sitting out whenever they feel like it. So here's what's happening. Players are redshirting now, which is so weird because I don't even know how players have the power to redshirt themselves. Like, that's what's crazy to me is that you always used to hear that players would redshirt. It was a coach's decision. But now apparently players can decide to redshirt on their own, and then they'll enter the transfer portal when they can legally enter it starting December 9th. Yeah, I think it's just kind of like a... a a really bureaucratic procedure. I don't even know if bureaucratic is the right word because, for example, this Matt Sluka kid, I don't know how that worked or what kind of decision he had, but he pretty much told the team, I'm not going to play anymore. So do what you want with me. I'm not going to play anymore. Register me or not, I'm not playing. So I think that that's really the situation the student-athletes put the coaches in. It's in a situation where the coach is pretty much compelled to let you do as you please and do what you want because then they can turn around and tell other recruits or other people in the media, well, he's keeping me hot. He's doing this. He doesn't let me go. So I just, it's still, there's a lot to be done here. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. In fact, look at what's happened at Iowa, Sebastian. Uh, LaShawn Williams, uh, who was sixth in the Big Ten in rushing yards last year, had 821 yards with two touchdowns, missed time in fall camp due to injury, didn't play the last two games, and has now decided he's going to leave the program and enter the transfer portal. So he won't be able to enter it officially until December the 9th, but that's, again, something that colleges are dealing with right now. Uh, frankly, I think that the NCAA, what they're trying to do with the new restriction, you could say, is take power out of the players. Not that they've been abusing it, but they've certainly been extending it to the limits. Now, shorting it from 45 to 30 days, the only real effect that I can see it having is players having to commit earlier or in this case not lead on teams as though we see in professional sports leagues Uh, frankly college athletes are trying to bargain their best deal and you can't really blame them for it but from what i'm seeing from the ncaa is that 
they're trying to tell college athletes that they can't hold all of the power, and if they're going to make a transfer decision, they have to make it quick. We're not in depths or in the grimes of how long 15 days can really extend deals, but that's that's the best we could get from this. But if we're talking about a long-term effect, then in reality, I, I believe it isn't going to have one. It, the, the period in which they shorten it to doesn't doesn't really doesn't really extend the timetables. Well, remember... They could they could take as long as they want to figure out what school they're going to go to. It's just they can only enter the portal now during those 20 days in the winter and 10 days in the spring. So as long as they get into the portal, hey, if they want to wait till the summer to decide where they're going to go, they can. Although it would behoove them to decide sooner rather than later so they can get a head start on their new program. Uh, exactly. But the thing with that is, is you still have some time to enter the portal, but the shorter restrictions uh, will allow them to be able to have to commit quicker. Uh, again, they have, they have a shorter timetable. So it'll have to be made quicker decisions. Obviously, you do have that if you want to move schools, but the entire process still takes time. Mm-hmm. When you take some of that time away, you're possibly putting that power back into the colleges because not only are pitches going to have to be a little bit more efficient, but if a player is going to commit, then they have to be fully committed. Because one thing that at least I keep seeing is people committing and then uncommitting, yeah. which frankly is something that I don't stand with. I think that once you put your word that you're committed to an institution, you should be committed to said institution. So possibly what the NCAA is trying to do is they're trying to make sure that people and athletes live up to their word. But again, I just don't think that 15 days is enough of a removal to put power back into a 50-50 flow. I hear you. All right. Uh, we are a little bit past the bottom of the hour. Let's get right back to uh, Sebastian. He's standing by with one last Sports Center update. Thank you, Steve. Let's get to the headlines. New Orleans State quarterback Derek Carr has suffered an oblique injury on last night's loss to the Kansas City Chiefs, a source confirmed to ESPN. An MRI taken today confirmed the injury was to Carr's oblique. According to the source, oblique injuries typically lead to multi-week absences. The Saints played two games in the 10 days, Sunday against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and then October 17th against the Denver Broncos. Let the Rattler theories and investigations begin. Let's stick it with the NFL. See, the Jets have fired Robert Sala after a 2-3 and three start. Upset by the team's 2-3 and three start, Jets owner Woody Johnson has made a stunning and unprecedented move this morning. Firing Robert Sala and naming defensive coordinator Jeff Ulbrich as the interim head coach. Johnson, in his first in-season coaching change in 25 years of ownership, said he consulted with general manager Joe Douglas, but he called it my decision in mine alone. Let's stay with the NFL. Drake May and the Patriots plan to start the rookie against the Houston Texans. As rookie Drake May is taking over the New England starting position. This comes after nine-year veteran Jacoby Brissett has led the Patriots to what has been an abysmal 1-4 in four start. The Patriots are hoping that the rookie Drake May can lead the Patriots past the Houston Texans this upcoming Sunday. Let's take a look at the scoreboard. Currently, it's the New York Mets running away with it at the top of the Eighth, leading the Phillies six to nothing. That top of the eighth stands as the New York Mets hold the lead. That was your final Sports Center update for Sports Talk. I'm Sebastian Perez Navarro. All right, Sebastian, thank you very much. Thirty-five now past the hour, five oh five six zero zero nine. That is our telephone number as we continue. Five oh five six zero zero nine. All right. Uh in the meantime, uh, you know, in addition to the college news, uh we've got again UTEP back on the road starting uh, they they leave tomorrow. Thursday will be the big one against Western Kentucky. In fact, John is standing by. We'll get uh, Taish with us here coming up in our final countdown before uh, we head out to him at uh, Border City L House, 1506 Lee Trevino for Utah football with Scotty Walden. Kind of a wild week, by the way, guys. We've got a coach's show. Listen to this. We have a coach's show this Tuesday. We have a coach's show Friday. And the team is landing at 4 a.m. Friday morning. In fact, I don't even know how I'm going to function Friday because I'm with them on this trip. So I can't wait 
to hear what John is going to be like Friday when they go live at 6. He'll probably spend the whole day sleeping and catch up on all that misrest and be ready to go when he does the second coaches show of the week later this week, Friday. And I believe in that regard, they're back at Dead Beach. And, uh, you know, think about it. You got Alehouse tonight, playing tomorrow, game Thursday, back 4 a.m. Friday, 6 o'clock, right back for another coaches show. Yeah, that's that's uh, the rough schedule of, of being a sports broadcaster or, you know, a coach in D, at the D1 level. So John Teicher, he's always prepared, always ready, no matter the travel or the plane rides that they that UTEP puts him through. So I'm excited for this uh, hectic week. We got a little baseball, a little UTEP football. It's going to be a fun one. It is going to be a fun one. Oh, I can't, I can't wait to hear John dissect what his week is going to be like when he joins us during our final countdown. Because, you know, we'll get those thoughts. We'll get his thoughts on the baseball postseason and everything else going on. So, yeah, John will, uh, I'm sure, give us – I mean, he's been doing it forever, right? So that's another thing. John's uh, John's 40-plus broadcasting, closing in on almost 45 years when you think about it. But he's never done this until last year with these weeknight October games that change each week and completely throw everything for a loop. Because this schedule is unlike anything we've ever seen around here because Conference USA, like most leagues, has always traditionally played on Saturdays. But we've seen an occasional Friday game. We just haven't seen Wednesday, you know, Thursdays and, and Tuesday night games. Yeah, what the conference will do for primetime airtime, right? So yes. it's definitely a sacrifice, and it's uh, chalk it up to just uh, the, the game, the sport, or, you know, the profession. But, you know, you definitely have to feel for not only John Teicher, but you know what? The players getting Everybody. home. Yeah, getting getting here at El Paso to El Paso at 4 in the morning, that takes a toll on you. What if you have a class on Friday? What do you have a test on Friday? You know, a lot of these things aren't even thought about anymore because we're seeing these athletes, these student athletes, as just athletes and yeah. money makers. Forget, hey, they have to also produce in the classroom, and if Very they true. do, there is there is repercussions, and you have to ask, what does getting getting to 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 El Paso at four a.m. What does that do for for your academic uh, career and and for your classes that you're handling? Oh, but let's put it this way, okay? What are the alternatives? You spend the night in Nashville and you fly out first thing Friday, and then what if you get back and you miss class because you get in late? So there's the other there's the other part of the double edged sword. Yeah, it's it's the logistics of college football, right? And then, sure. And then the middle of the week that's that really complicates things. And soon here we'll be talking about basketball and football all clashing with each other. It'll be very now, fun. Now wait a minute, I got a question, uh, Sebastian. You're this is your freshman year, right? Yes, it is. You have any Friday classes? I thankfully do not. I just have to See, go to the prospector. I'm convinced that Friday is the easiest day of the week when you're in college. Very few classes are actually being held on Friday. So if there's ever a day to get back and catch up on your Z's, it's going to be Friday. Yeah, it's definitely Friday. You rarely see students take classes on Fridays, and the students that are on campus on Fridays are usually freshmen who don't realize, wait, I could have completely omitted a Friday from my schedule, could have had Monday through Thursday, That's right. and a Friday completely off. So I made that mistake my freshman year and then never again. So, yeah, there is a lot of free time on Fridays for college students, so there's no excuses for them. So, yeah, 4 a.m., that's not going to be pretty, though. Good to see Sebastian didn't make that mistake uh, for his freshman year. Good job, Sebastian. We're proud of you. When we come back, John live with us, Border City L House, 1506 Lee Trevino, 20 minutes away from UTEP football with Scotty Walden right here on your home for UTEP Sports, 600 ESPN El Paso. Final countdown, winding things up. 15 in front of six here on Sports Talk. Tonight, 15 minutes from now. Top of the hour, John Teicher. It'll be Utah football with Scotty Walden coming your way from Border City L House. It was my home yesterday. It's John's home today. 1506 Lee Trevino. Head on down. You can talk a little Utah football with John and Coach Walden. And John Teicher joins us live right now uh, from the L House as we continue. John, you're watching the Mets put the finishing touches on this uh, game with the Phils. And then after that, Dodgers Padre should be a fun one as well tonight as that series is tied at one apiece. Yeah, the emotions are a little bit high between those two teams, aren't they? And their fan bases as well. So it's going to be interesting to see the uh, atmosphere tonight in, in San Diego. It's probably going to be uh, crazy, but uh, what a great playoff it's been already with uh, all four series now tied at one. Sure is. How do you see the uh, playoffs going right now? 
I think it's uh, anybody's ball game, really. I, I, it's it's amazing, Steve, what's happened over the years. It's just uh, nothing seems to go to form anymore, and there are just so many factors that uh, that go into this thing. But uh, the bottom line seems to be, if you're playing your best baseball at this time of year, you got a chance. Uh, you've got a chance, a legitimate chance in the playoffs. That Dodgers Padres series is fascinating, isn't it? Oh, no question. I, you know, the Padres have been chasing the Dodgers ever since they entered the National League way back in 1969. And, uh, you know, the way it looks right now, I, you look at the two clubs, and uh, I think the Padres have uh, much the better of the uh, starting pitching. And uh, I would be surprised if the Dodgers were able to get them in a, in a best-of-five series. I would, too. Uh, John, we talked about it before we brought you on the show, and that is uh, this is going to be uh, one of those weeks where you look back and you say to yourself, this is why I love my job as the voice of the minors. <laughs> Two coaches' shows, including one about, I would say... 14 hours after you land from, uh, you know, Nashville after the Bowling Green game coming up in when, or in the game in Bowling Green against Western Kentucky Thursday. Uh, it's a, it's going to be a fun week, isn't it? Yeah. What was I thinking? And I'm still uh, 25 years old, but, uh, you know what it's going to do, Steve? It's going to take me back to my minor league baseball days. And the, the slogan I kind of use is day game after a night game. And we had plenty of those throughout the course of the year and there might have been some travel involved and maybe a bus trip uh, as well in between a, a night game somewhere and a day game uh, somewhere else so uh, it'll be a little bit of an adventure uh, this week we'll see if uh, we'll see if we survive so you're telling me that when you were doing baseball games you did have over the years a 4 a.m. arrival flight combined <laughs> with a seven o'clock baseball game the, that same that that same day no, I, I don't know that uh, it, it was quite that extreme, but uh, there were there were times where, you know, obviously you traveled day of game and, and did a game that uh, that particular day or, or may have been on a bus ride that got in in the, uh, in the wee small hours and, and might have had a, uh, an event either uh, during the day in the afternoon or in the uh, in the evening the, the next night. So, you know, it's it's. It's it's it, you kind of look back upon your your experiences and you and you draw from that. So uh, uh, that's that's the way I choose to to look at uh, at what awaits uh, all of us uh, the rest of this week. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it'll be fun. And listen, I'll say this, and you know this as well as anybody. Those kind of trips always seem to go a lot faster after a big dub versus the other outcome. So. I look at it this way, Tysh. The last time I was with you was Miami a year ago for Vice Night, and FIU thought that UTEP was coming in to be made an example of on their Miami Vice theme promotion, and when they were down 21 nothing, they didn't even know what hit them in the first quarter. That was the end of that. So I'm really hoping that lightning can strike twice tomorrow, on uh, Thursday when I think Western has those new helmets with the eyes coming out of it uh, for their game with the Miners, and, you know, UTEP has uh, something in store for them, that's for sure. Your good luck, Steve. Why do we wait uh, until the third road game of the season to bring you along? That's, Ask Rick uh, Romero question. that question, and you'll get a good answer, I'm sure. So, yeah. But, uh, no, this one, uh, this should be uh, should be fun. And, uh, you know, again, as tough as this season has been, including last week's uh, game against Sam Houston State, people forget there's still seven games left in the regular season and a lot of conference games. Uh, of the seven, six of them are conference games. Yeah, and I think, Steve, after this one in particular, I think the schedule will slightly lighten up a little bit and certainly not to take anything away from the likes of FIU and Louisiana Tech, who will be the, the next two. But I don't think you can look at them. You know, who was the top two picks in the league uh, this year? They were... Uh, uh, they were uh, middle T- not middle Tennessee but uh, Liberty whom yep. the Miners Open Conference USA play with and now Western Kentucky along with uh, Sam Houston uh, arguably three of the top four or five uh, programs in uh, Conference USA you throw Nebraska into that mix and uh, and Colorado State a good uh, Mountain West team that took Oregon State into overtime on the road uh, last week and I think the first half of uh, Scotty Walden's first season at UTEP has been very, very challenging. Uh, I don't expect that uh, the second half is going to be quite as much so. So 
maybe that will give uh, the Miners some opportunity. Yeah, that's exactly what you hope, and uh, we'll see if, in fact, uh, it uh, turns into just that. Hey, meanwhile, speaking of the Miners, uh, while you're on the air, we got the UTEP volleyball team getting ready for the first of two days for their big Battle of I-10 uh, Memorial Gym against uh, New Mexico State. What an opportunity this is going to be. And anytime Ben Wallace gets to meet uh, his mentor, uh, Mike uh, Jordan, and what he's done over the years at uh, New Mexico State, you know you're always going to be in for a great one. Yeah, some great volleyball the next two nights uh, in El Paso and at Club Memorial, as as they call it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and what a job uh, Ben has done with this uh, UTEP program, and what a great uh, atmosphere Club Memorial is going to have the uh, the next two nights with the minor fans uh, mixed in with those from Las Cruces coming over to watch uh, the matches uh, the next two nights. So if you've never seen a collegiate uh, volleyball match, you owe it to yourself to get out to Memorial Gym either tonight or again uh, tomorrow with both matches starting at uh, 6 o'clock, and you're going to see some very, very talented athletes uh, do what they do. I'll tell you something else, okay, and uh, this is really, I think, the best way to put it, is if uh, Scotty Walden's able to do in in due time what we've seen Ben Wallace do with the volleyball program, that kind of gives you a little taste of the kind of potential we would see with the whole city talking about it, just like uh, volleyball has taken over, you know, taken over this town by storm. And we know what, uh, we all know what the Sun Bowl's like when it's uh, full and the fans are animated and into it and they know that uh, their team is uh, is competitive and uh, has a shot to win uh, every game they play so yeah if uh, if scotty's able to do what uh, what ben's done it's it's going to be a good time for uh, for El Paso uh, for sure in, in the years to come. Let's wrap it up with what Vanderbilt did this past weekend uh, against the Aggies. Uh, since, I'm sorry, against uh, the uh, Alabama Crimson Tide. But it is kind of like New Mexico State East when you see what Diego Pavia was able to do and uh, wild scene out there in Vandy. Individually, who's got a better record against SEC competition than Diego Pavia's got over the last two years? He's 2-0. and it's Auburn amazing. a year ago, Alabama this year. He owns the state of Alabama. He does. He does. And I feel like an NIL opportunity waiting to happen for Diego, right? And he's ready to cash in on this, uh, on the, on these wins. Well, what a winner he is and just makes uh, everybody around him uh, so much uh, better. It's, uh, it's a fun thing to see. All right, John. Have a great show tonight at the Yale House and uh, we'll talk to you again here at the top of the hour. Okay, Steve. Thanks. John Teicher's coming up next, folks. UTEP football with Scotty Walden. If you missed any of today's show, we'll have it for you on demand. Huge thanks to Alberto Dueta and Sebastian Perez Novato for holding down the fort. Again, no show tomorrow for baseball. Just an hour on Thursday. Adrian will be back for that, and then I'll talk to you again Friday from Speaking Rock. In the meantime, enjoy UTEP football with Scotty Walden.